Winthorpe, you're supposed to eat them, not drop them. This is Winthorpe, and this is his roadmap to success. Now, uh, I really like him because he, we color coordinated today. Uh, but no, he's a great dog, but he's a 140 pound dog and he doesn't know any boundaries. So I'm gonna actually, this is his roadmap to success. We're gonna talk about uh, what we talked about in the session. I'm gonna do something a little bit unusual what I normally do. I'm gonna have the guardian, uh, the person filming step like three steps to the right or that way and then about a couple steps back. So you see this area right here. He just kept on shoving his way through here. So one of the things I did is I wanted to show the guardians how to claim their personal space using the escalating consequences. Remember the escalating consequences for number one is the hiss, one time per incident. Number two is to stand up abruptly, turn to face him and keep him in front of you. As soon as he stops moving, take two steps backwards and pause for one second. Then you can go back to doing what you're doing. But if you're, what you were doing is sitting down, you should expect him to challenge you again. The third consequence is to march deliberately at the dog until it turns sideways or until you get to the boundary. So what I would say is if he tries to shove his way through here once, the second time he does, what I have the guardians do is, well, I didn't have him do this because they didn't know what it was, but if he's over here walking towards here and you know he's gonna try to go there, hiss at him when he's about a foot away. And literally do the hiss, don't say hiss. That won't work. And then usually it turns, and he, it, he was doing really well for me, he would just turn and walk the other direction. If your timing and your intensity is right. But if he's at level four energy and I hiss at him level two, he won't hear it. You have to meet or exceed his energy level. So what I have them doing is, and they had to do this over and over again, one of the dirty secrets of dog behavior is to have to always follow through. So I had uh, whoever was sitting here, she had to stand up and turn to face him. And we weren't letting him pass, go through there. And we waited for him as soon as he walked away or sat down, and then we'd take two little tiny steps backwards, pause for one second, then turn, so they're facing this direction again, pause for one second, then sit down, but again, sit on the edge of the couch. And he would come back a second time, they stood up and did it again. Then he stopped moving, take a two steps backwards, turn. Well, imagine he's not here. And then sit down, when he sits down, you just expect him to come and challenge again. So he had to get up over and over again. But after a while he learned and he stopped trying to do it. And, it. and instead of him nibbling or doing other things, as soon as they stood up, he'd take a step backwards. Now, so what I would do is the first time he shoves his way through, then after that, I'm gonna hiss. Second time he does it, we're gonna stand up on both sides and not let him go through. We had somebody sitting here as well, and when he tried to go this way, then that person came, and we made, said, okay, well, the new consequence is, now you can't be on the carpet. So the person was there and here, and we got up, and we kind of marched towards him together and made him leave, and we stopped enforcing right here at the edge of the carpet. Now, then, of course, then he went around that way, so I went over there and blocked there. So you're gonna have a lot of getting up and sitting down at first, but eventually he's gonna like, he's going to figure out, as soon as I try to shove my way in, I get, the further, more I try to shove, the further away I get. Now, um, we also talked about, uh, and so, but also use this as an opportunity, like have somebody have a snack sitting there in the middle and have one person on either side so you can practice enforcing it while somebody smells really good. Love it, he's already self-exercising. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. Now, uh, what we'll talk about right now. So uh, one of the first questions I ask is, uh, is about his exercise. Uh, he gets an exercise. He gets a walk about midday. Dogs have two energy bursts in the morning and the evening. So you really want to make sure, find out when that is, and make sure you exercise them at that time or right before that time, or those times. So I recommend the guardian start an exercise journal. Um, one of the things I did is I got a laser out, he was chasing the laser. So create a little lap or have him chase the laser for a certain number of uh, length of time. Um, the stairs is another one where I went to the top of the stairs, we threw a treat to the bottom of the stairs, when he went down and lifted up, we said the word lobby. And when he came back up, we used the word uh, paycheck. Now she made kind of, the guardian just made kind of a, I think a, I think she, it was her attempt at a hiss, and she went Ch -ch -ch, something like that. Doesn't work. That's like a horse sound. So, is the sound like you're saying ship, but what, without the hit? And uh, remember, the hiss is before the dog does the wrong thing. Once the dog is breaking the rule, or if you don't know what they're doing, don't just hiss at them. Go and find out for sure. Remember, following through is a way of burning energy. So, uh, hey, hey, Humphrey. He's got something in his mouth right now. Humphrey. Puppy, puppy, puppy. So now I follow through, and here's a couple of treats. I just hold him in front of his mouth, wait for him to drop him, and put it in his mouth. Now, um, the guardians have been taking things away from him, and that makes a, a low value item a high value item. He also has learned that misbehaving is the best way to get attention from the humans. Any attention is validating. So if he steals a shoe and we get up and chase him, that's fun for him. So we want to, first of all, take away all temptation. So anything that he might be able to get his uh, mouth or paws on, uh, a little Christmas ornament, some sort of looks like. 
Uh, so we want to limit his access to things because all he's doing is doing that as a way of asking us for attention. So when his guardians, uh, uh, when he comes up and he, he's rambunctious, he's mouthy, he's, he's stealing things, the first thing we should do is go and check the exercise journal. Exercise journal is just a book that we put in. The day at the top of the page, we're at the time and how long the walk was, the time and how many up and down those stairs, the time and how many fetches, the time and how many laser or whatever the game is. And the idea is um, to give him, you know, whatever his maximum number is. So go to the stairs and throw the treat up and down until he just lays down and says, I'm not coming up anymore. Now we know what his maximum number is. Then we might exercise him with 50% or a third of his maximum number. Um, and then uh, write down the exercise journal. Then a couple hours later, he gets mouthy again. We to put him in the exercise journal for a walk or the laser or whatever it is. Then we keep on doing this. At the end of the day, we give him a letter grade A through F. The next day, we play around with it. We add the whole extra game of exor uh, exercise regimen or add some quantities to the, the repetitions or uh, to the exercise we're already doing. Keep on doing that till the end of the day. He gets an A grade. And also, when he gets mouthy, write that in the exercise journal. He gets barky, write that in the exercise journal. Surge of energy, exercise journal. Um, steal something, exercise journal. After a while, you'll see how often the frequency is that you need to exercise him to put him in position to succeed. Okay, um, now, um, so uh, let me think. Uh, other, other rules, well, exercise is number one. Keep the exercise journal about two to four weeks until eventually you know what he needs to get. And again, if he gets rambunctious or mouthy, he's not being naughty, he's saying, I need some exercise. Okay, so the other thing we talked about are, are some rules. He doesn't really have any rules. He's allowed on the furniture, he climbs up, he gets in people's personal space, and he doesn't really have a lot of motivation. Also, one of the guardians doesn't think that, that he should have to get a treat for everything, which he doesn't necessarily have to get a treat, but he does need to be recognized and rewarded for the things we want, because if somebody does a great job and nobody ever recognizes or rewards them, and it's a selfless thing, they're gonna stop doing that selfless thing because they're not getting any recognition, unless they're very special. Uh, so basically, what we want to do is make sure we acknowledge and recognize him, and, uh, and I like to do that through passive training and petting with a purpose. Passive training for him is going to be uh, probably the first thing we should talk about. Passive training is waiting for him to organically do something on his own without any influence. So if you come to me right now, I pet him and say, here. I recommend change the word from come to here. Uh, every time he sits down, pet him and say, sit. Every time he lays down, pet him and say, crash. Every time he brings you this toy, maybe we call it the blue snake. And name all your individual toys. Now, a ball, all balls can be balls, bones, etc. But naming the separate toys allows you to say, no, give me the chicken. Now, let's play with the chicken. Now, that's the duck. Give me the chicken. And eventually, he knows what he's learning. Now, he's going to get the chicken. Now, he's going to get some exercise or go steal another, uh, another ornament, probably. Uh, so, but again, that should be added to the exercise journal, and then we should immediately get him some exercise. Um, okay, so, um, so speaking of toys, I'd like his guardians to get him a water buffalo horn, at least one if not two. Make sure it's like a horn, make sure it's not, if it's hollow, that the walls are not too thin or he'll splinter them. That wall should be about a half an inch thick or completely solid. And uh, that will probably outlast the dog. Also get him some elk antlers. They're expensive, but he needs big, hearty things to chew on. He has some bones, uh, make sure they're boiled bones, not uh, uh, smoked bones. And then also, uh, I would get him a couple nylon bones. Um, they have giant ones, and they come with different flavors. And don't get the ones, they all look like a, like a cartoon, which is fine. You can get a couple of those, actually, you probably should have a couple of those. I'd like everybody in the house to have an antler, or especially the two girls, an antler or one of those nylon bones in their pockets or leggings at all times. So if he, if he mouths us, first thing we do is he yelp like a little girl, like, ah! and then we're gonna freeze for a second, he would have, and if he goes back at it, then the second thing we're gonna do is pull this out. If there's a dog, we're gonna tease him with it and get him going around and, and let him latch onto it and then pull it and then take it away. And he actually, one time we did it, he took it out as a trophy and went off and played with it. Immediately pick up another antler and put it in your leggings, otherwise next time you have it, you wanna have it. Now the other thing we can do is what we call a negative punishment, which is to deduct something from the equation, in this case, the human. Now the problem, we have to be careful about this, and this is why I would really go around the house and really kind of dog proof all the rooms he hang out with, it's not forever. It's just like a month or two, remove anything that he might go and grab, because that's what he's trying to do is get your attention. So the third time that he mouths you or nips you, you just immediately get up and leave the area. You can step on the other side of the baby gate if that stops him, or go through it and close the door behind him. What I'm telling him is when, you, when he puts his paws on you, it's his way of saying, I need more exercise or I want you to play with me. What I want you guys to tell him is, it hurts me, that's why I yelp or here's something to play with because I'm preoccupied, or if you do this, it causes me to leave, which is the exact opposite of what he's trying to accomplish. 
So that's a really kind of a passive training sort of thing as well. You put your paws on me it, or my mouth on me, it calls me a leaf. Now if I'm petting a dog and it puts its paw on my arm, it's a form of dominance, so immediately stop doing that. Do not practice the shake anymore, because if you like this, you must really like this is how the dog looks at it. Um, and uh, like I said, the exercise is gonna help you with a lot of that. Now, uh, passive training is just waiting for the dog to organically offer you something. So if he goes there, we would call him that uh, Hawaii. So every time he goes there, just call it Hawaii. Um, every time he takes his first bite of food, come up with a favorite, maybe a favorite restaurant, maybe you call it La Casa. So every time he takes a bite of food, you say pizza or whatever it is. And it, one of those funny command words. I also like the guardians to make a list of the official command words and tape them in their fridge or somewhere. And if somebody's saying, come, you're like, ah, vocabulary, you're like, oh yeah, it's here now, here. And also when I ask a dog to come, a lot of times I use my hand like this. And I have, my hand, I have a treat in it, I have my hand cupped. Well, from your perspective, you can't tell if I have something on my hand or not, but from a dog, it looks like I'm holding something. For dogs, the lower you go, the more appealing or enticing it is to the dog. And literally, watch me, I went all the way to the floor. I tell people, like, lower it until the dog comes to you. They're like, well, there's more to lower. So keep going all the way down if you need to. Um, and when he comes to you, then I usually raise it to put him in a sit, but he doesn't like to sit. And I think part of it is he's like sitting anywhere that's not carpet and we're on hardwood floors in this level for the most part. So try to make sure he's in an area where he can, but use passive training. Every time he sits, make sure you pet him and make a big deal out of it so that you could tell him to sit, because I've worked with Danes before, they can sit. Uh, but you do want to make sure that he doesn't have any, it's just so little sitting that I would be, I would want the guardians to make sure there isn't a mobility or a joint issue with his hips. Right, so you might want to have a vet take a look just to make sure. Uh, okay, now the other thing we talked about is pe uh, petting with a purpose. We can't, we didn't need to sit for this, but petting with a purpose is rewarding the dog when the dog initiates contact. He comes and nudges me, invades my personal space, I'm gonna tell him to sit. If he's already sitting, I'm asking him to sit over here or lay down. He has to do something to change his state in order to earn the affection from me. If somebody tells me what to do, that's a leadership quality. If they ask me what to do, that's a follow-up quality. And we need him to adopt more of a follower's mindset. So he comes up and nudges the humans or invades a personal space, Nothing happens other than they give him a counter order. When he sits, we pet him under his chin and say the word sit. And just the word sit, not good dog or good boy or good sit, just sit. Um, and so uh, after a while, he'll come and start sitting in front of you or laying down to prepay for attention. When he does, make sure we do recognize or reward them. And if we suspect somebody is petting without a purpose, we're going to say the word paycheck. That person has to stop petting and then uh, ask the dog to do something else and pet him again. And then we can tell the other person, you missed it. I did do the right thing. But if you argue about it, the dog sees that you're on your own page too. Um, okay, so some of the rules we went over, not being allowed in the furniture. When we do that, I can do a dog bed. Um, uh, can you uh, go grab him and I'll show you how to do the dog bed so we have this on video. I will talk about other rules in the meantime. So rules for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or correlation or status they have. So sitting here says we're equals. Now he likes to kind of sit with his butt here and kind of sit with his paws out rather than sitting on his haunches. So um, what I recommend the guardians do is get a dog bed, go to Groupon, look for the Sealy Posture Peeling or the Memory Foam one, and get a square or a rectangular one, no pattern, a light gray, a white, or a cream. Can you see the dog bed in the shot right now? Winthor. So we're calling it Hawaii. So I throw one on there. He's already had a whole bunch, so he must be out of it. Uh, or a full. I don't know how he could probably be full. Winthor. Puppy, puppy, puppy. Winthor. Now, if you call a dog multiple times and they're not listening, you're training them to ignore you. Winthor. Puppy! So I can make another sound to get him to pay attention, and I just throw the treat onto the dog bed. I'm not enticing him to go there. He saw me do it. He can see them there. And we're going to say the word Hawaii. Hawaii. So uh, this way, every time he goes there, we, we, we well, we're going to teach him to go there on command. Now, he likes this dog bed, but I would recommend getting, like I said, the rectangular one, and build a base so it, it's about maybe six to eight inches high and then put the dog bed on top of it. That way it has a little bit of sass, not as much sass as humans have, but he can go and do his butt sitting thing that he likes doing here. Now for here, I'd recommend getting X like that. That's uh, what we call that, thrown. There you go, thrown. Um, remember, passively trained funny things. So if he puts his chin on, on the table, call that bed or grovel and give him a treat. He'll probably do that in a second. And I'll reward it when I have treats ready to go. Uh, so uh, other rules uh, uh, that we can incorporate, um, I don't uh, allow. I wouldn't allow him on this carpet when somebody's eating at this table. 
I would make sure the humans are eating something first. So close to a growl. Um, make sure that he sits or lays down before you let him in or out the door. Um, and double length of time. Tell him to sit. If he doesn't sit, wait. Walk away for one minute and sit down some more. Sitting is tra temporary transitory. After one minute, go back and command him again. Tell him to sit. If he doesn't sit, then walk away for two minutes and four minutes and eight minutes. Eventually, he'll go sit at the door as his way of saying he wants to go outside. We also took a look, talked a little bit about potty training because he doesn't have a word for potty. And they don't know for sure if he wants to go out and potty or not. They just think he, he whines, whimpers, invades your personal space. Well, those are things we don't want him to do. So the way to teach him to uh, go potty is take him out and go outside. And as soon as he starts to pee or poop, say the word Putin or whatever the word is you want. And then as soon as, uh, and then uh, in a normal tone of voice. And then as soon as he, now would be a good opportunity to practice the drop. Winthorpe, no, he already dropped it. So when he, for the drop, when he has things in his mouth, and not holding it, but in his mouth, just grab a treat, hold it in front of him, and as soon as he drops it, pop in his mouth and say drop, and don't go for the object. That makes, it trains him, so when you say drop, he's just happy to drop anything you want. Now if he steals something he's not allowed to have, that's when we need to do a trade. So then we would go to give him a drop with a bully stick or a marrow bone, not when he go downstairs, he's, he just went downstairs again, he's probably gonna get some more loot. Uh, a cow's kneecap from the green spot are one of my favorites, and I think you'll use a lot of those. So that way, when he takes something you don't want, you get him to drop, and then give him something of equal or greater value because you're taking the item away. But you want to practice it with low value items so he's happy to do it. All right, for the dog bed, what I do is when the dog's looking at me, I toss a treat on the dog bed, he goes over and looks it up, I say the word Hawaii. He walks away, I toss another treat on the, and say Hawaii. I do this for about 10 treats. The other way I can bring him over there and put him in L-I-Y or S-I-T and pop the treat in his mouth and say Hawaii again. The third way I do is like I'm doing right now is I leave the treats there when he's not in the room and don't point it out when he comes in the room and he goes over and licks them up, say the word why. If he gets them and you don't see him, it's okay because he's still getting reinforced. This is to entice him to go there. After a while, he'll go there on his own. So he goes and lays down, toss the treat at that point. So now when I go and lay down here, I get a treat. Treats fall from the sky. Every time I come over here, I'm going to hang out here. This is a good place to hang. You can do the same thing with your kennel. Just go to the kennel, throw a treat in there. And I would do this on the bed like we talked about. Get the treaty trainers and wrinkle the bag. And who's going to hear that? Toss the treat in the dog bed when he runs over there, uh, or in the dog uh, uh, kennel. And you might want to come up with a new word for that, even though he, he doesn't have a problem with it. He was a little, a little bit reluctant to go in there. So maybe call it Palace or Jamaica or something that's a funny command word. Uh, and then uh, toss the treats in there until he goes in there without any hesitation. And remember, when you let him out, open the door and put your feet right up against the gate or the door. Open the gate behind you, but use your feet to block him from exiting. Wait for him to lay down. As soon as he lays down, take drop a knee, call, uh, take some space back, and then call him out and give him the command word and say, release or freedom or parole or whatever the fun word you want to use is. So now we create, you know, just because the door's open doesn't mean I can go out. I have to wait for permission for the human to go out. And building in these sort of things is really, especially for the girls, is going to be really important. Now, I'd like the girls to uh, actually be the ones who are feeding him. That's one of the other rules is he has to eat after the humans eat first. And we're not going to leave food in his bowl. And remember, for the bowl, every, you get an elevated feeder about this height for his, a dog his size. Right now, that, uh, it's about that high. Uh, let me see. So when you guys are feeding him, and you might want to actually, for this next week, feed him by hand. I know it's kind of slobbery and all that fun stuff, but you're literally the hand that feeds him. And feeding is important for them. Now, I wouldn't feed him by hand first because at first he's going to walk over his bowl and go, I don't feel like eating right now. That's fine. Pick up the bowl and dump it. Remember, before you do this, go put food in his bowl, but don't let him near it. Kind of the way that I showed you with the third consequence with the top, with the uh, carpet. Then as soon as he stops protesting, then you have a chip or something that you can eat first. And then you eat some, a chip or five more bites or your real meal if you can, but you're not allowing him to go within five feet of his bowl. And then when you get done, you walk over and invite him. He probably, the first day or two, probably won't. Because like, ah, I can eat whatever I want. Food's always there. As soon as he walks more than seven paces away, pick up the bowl, dump it empty, and put the empty bowl back down. He will kind of lick the empty bowl uh, probably 100% of the time. Um, and when you say, well, what's up? Well, when you walk away, the food goes away. And there's no food again until the next meal. So right now he's fed uh, twice a day. So I wouldn't feed him again until the next meal. I've had dogs go two or three days without eating. If it goes longer than three days, message me. But it probably means somebody in the house is cheating for him. And people in the house actually feed him people food as well. And for a dog to be within seven feet of us, if anyone with a high value item is their way of challenging for it. Even if they're not actively begging, it's inappropriate for them to be that close. So if we tell the dog to come to us and we take some of our hamburger and give it to the dog, we are training it to do something it knows it morally should not do. 
So I would recommend no more feeding from the uh, people food from the table under any circumstance. If you do want to feed them some people food, make sure it's, it doesn't have garlic and onion in it because those are toxic to dogs. Also grapes, raisins, currants, uh, avocado, uh, onions, uh, macadamia nuts, dark chocolate, root vegetables. Uh, if you grow tomatoes, the green stalks of the tomato plant are toxic, the tomatoes are not. Um, those are all toxic to dogs. Also xylitol, which is a fake sugar and a lot of candy. Um, and dogs shouldn't get caffeine or alcohol or sugar. Uh, so um, if we're feeding him those things, we're training him to violate a boundary and that's gonna be confusing for him. So what I wanna do instead is create a healthy boundary. So another rule should be that there's like a box around the dining room table coming from the work island to here. And then when you're at the dining room table, you can't go in there. And when you're eating here, you can't be here and not be allowed in the kitchen. Now remember we talked about uh, microwaving some bacon or something like that and simulating like we're cooking. And you might want to actually put painter's tape down so he knows exactly where the line is on the floor. And just bang around some pots and pans until eventually he sits or lies down outside the boundary. Then you put the bacon away, whatever you microwave to make it smell like food. And then you do your actual cooking, he doesn't know the difference. So you helped him warm up. Same thing with dinner or meeting a meal here. Microwave a piece of roast beef and then sit here and pretend like you're going to eat it, cut it into little pieces. Next may move for you and use establish the boundary. Uh, or set the table and before you serve your meal real meal microwave that piece of roast beef and sit down and cut it up and spread it up And you guys get turn take turns of uh, Enforcing the boundary eventually he learns just because I want something out of me and I can get it He's a large breed dog. He's used to throwing his weight around so he's gonna push in the boundaries We don't want to push against him. We want to in, 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 enforce invisible boundaries where he is doing the self-control himself Because he's too big for us to really do it um, and if we don't help him practice the, and understand the concept of it and practice doing it, there's no way he's going to do it when he really wants something. I mean, he kind of wants because it smells like something, but if he really gets things in his mind, unless we help him practice it, he's never going to do it. Okay, um, let me see. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, am I forgetting anything? Make sure that you really do a thorough job. I understand it's inconvenient to have to rearrange and take stuff out, but anything that he might get his paws on, Make sure to remove that. And go to Amazon and get about, he should have at least 20 toys. And again, antlers, I would get several antlers and get a couple of those nylon ones that look like real bones. So you have those you can put in your pockets. Uh, now the girls, I'd like to be hand feeding him uh, after he starts eating when you give him permission. When he's walking away from food, don't worry about hand feeding, just keep putting it in the bowl. But once he gets to the point where he's not challenging you for it, and when you give him permission to eat, he comes and eats. And if he eats 80% of his food and walks away, pick up the remaining 20% and dump it. Once you leave the bowl, the food is not there available until the next meal. Food eating is the most important activity for dogs. Just putting a little dominion over it really goes a long way towards helping. Um, Do you have a preference on colors? Um, the Guardians were using a prong collar, which I really am not a fan of because they release cortisol. Into the, it's a pain-causing device. That's why it works. And I find the dogs just pull. They just do it in a different way. They're not pulling lurching. They're pulling with more torque. Winthorpe! I'm surprised that didn't. Can you go open the front door? I uh, ring the doorbell, actually. That'll probably get him to come up. Uh, I just, just knock on the door then. Knock on it like you're the police. Knock on it like you're the police. Come in. There. Look at that. It's like I know what I'm doing. Winthorpe! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, your guardians might want to get a martingale collar. Um, I mean, I just don't like the using. Come here, buddy. Winthorpe. So he's to it, trying to do a little bit of mouthing. Now the guardians doing a good job. She turned. She, she stood up. Right, she turned to face it. She kept in her front. And there I wouldn't bark. He wasn't barking towards you. Just. Now go ahead. And here's the third consequence. Leave the room. Leave the room and close the door behind you. Yep, just go in there real quick. Close the door. So the third consequence is to leave. So he was mouthing and nipping at her, and so she put the door behind her, and he kind of bit her in this area, which is probably not very pleasant. So the next consequence is we leave the room. And he went and grumbled at the door, and he walked away. And so then we went and waited at least about 15 seconds before we come back out. Winthorpe, come. Hold on one sec. Winthorpe. Come here, buddy. Winthorpe. So this is, uh, we talked about his cum, and that's something I want you guys to really focus on, don't let him push his way in, for passive training. 
So every time he comes to you on his own, make sure you pass, uh, pet him and say here, and then follow the video that I talked about above, about teaching him to come and go out of the house. With our puppy. Come here, buddy. Look at all the streets in, in Hawaii. Now, if you can't get the dog to come all the way, throw a treat halfway between you and the, and the dog. Quint Thorpe. Puppy. Oh, we'll use, go ahead and use this thing. So one of the things I had him do was a laser. I just wanted him to come over here for the end of the video. There we go. This goofy guy is Quint Thorpe. And this is Quint Thorpe's roadmap to success. Remember, everything that you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it. Right, buddy? <laughs>